Welcome to our second lecture covering Chapter 5 of our textbook. Uh, the topic of Chapter 5 is Significant Hospitality Contracts. So let's do just a bit of a review to see what we covered in Lecture 1. We focused in Lecture 1 on this first topic. Well, we, we did kind of a general introduction about hospitality contracts generally, and we talked about specific contract clauses that we oftentimes see in a hospitality contract. Of course, in Chapter 5, we talked at great length about the elements of a contract, what you have to have in it, what you do when there's a breach, all those types of issues. In this lecture, we're going to talk about specific contracts that often arise in the hospitality in industry, specifically franchise agreements, management contracts, <clears throat> excuse me, and conference service contracts. So we're going to advance in our PowerPoint to slide 16 and go from here. So we're going to start talking about franchise contracts. A franchise is an agreement between two companies um, in which uh, there's a franchisor who has a business idea or a business model that the franchisee would like to use for the franchisee's business. Um, and so the two parties enter into a contract wherein the franchisor is going to give the franchisees access to <clears throat> the business model for the franchisor as well as access to things like advertising and be able to use various uh, trade secrets, um, copyrighted information, trademarks, trade dress, all of those goodies. Um, when a franchisee or a potential franchisee is considering whether he or she would like to buy into a franchise, obviously this is a big decision. There's a significant amount of money to buy a franchise, even a relatively small franchise is going to be uh, $10,000 or more just to kind of get your big toe into the um, into that particular business. Of course, if you're buying a hotel, you've got to build the facility and you've got to pay the franchising fee. And so you're talking typically millions of dollars in order to participate in that. So it's a very big financial decision for the franchisee to make. Um, and sometimes the information that's available to the franchisee, at least historically, was very limited. It was kind of a leap of faith in many cases for that franchisee to know exactly what he or she was getting. Well, <clears throat> um, Congress recognized this problem and passed a law that requires uh, that certain information be disclosed by the franchisor to potential franchisees. And the rules relating to these disclosures are uh, uh, enforced by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC down here. Um, and so these disclosures, <clears throat> the, the franchisor has to make. Uh, the FTC will confirm that the disclosures have been made, but what the FTC won't do is make sure that they're truthful. And so it could be that there's some puffery, there's some exaggeration in the disclosures. The FTC is not involved uh, directly in confirming the accuracy of the information. What um, the FTC is enforcing is oftentimes called the franchise rule, and these are the regulations developed by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, that uh, say exactly what the disclosures need to be. In, uh, uh, I guess about a decade ago, um, in the 2000s, the um, Federal Trade Commission revised the franchise rule and made additional disclosures uh, necessary in order for uh, the franchisor to be in compliance. And you can see all of this is tied to the idea of disclosing information. <clears throat> the franchisor has information. Some of that information is probably positive about the franchise, about its sales and other things along those lines. So obviously the franchisor wants to reveal that information to potential franchisees, but in some cases, is, um, the franchisor probably is reluctant to reveal information. Perhaps it's not um, the best information. Maybe it's the type of information that might persuade a potential franchisee to pass on this opportunity. Or it could be that the franchisor just doesn't want to reveal the information because he or she is concerned that uh, competitors might be able to take advantage of this information. Um, whichever the situation is, you can see how um, without having the franchise rule, franchisees might not be able to get all the information that they need in order to make an informed and wise decision. So uh, this is information about that revised franchise rule that came down the pike several years ago. Um, and it basically increased the amount of information that uh, franchisors had to reveal. Um, information about earnings, about um, advertised claims, about the contents of the franchise agreement, about the potential of refunds. 
also this the revised franchise rule limits what um, or uh, uh, states that a franchisor can't contradict information in its revised franchise rule release that um, can't contradict that information in another document that perhaps is not controlled by the FTC. You don't need to know the, the ins and outs of, of this um, issue. What I'm really looking for you knowing about with respect to the revised franchise rule is that um, it requires more disclosure than has previously been made or required by the FTC. So don't be too concerned about knowing these specific um, disclosures that need to be made. <clears throat> So this is information that you're not going to find in the textbook because this is Texas specific information. So um, it's especially important that you uh, that we fl you flag this information and pay attention to this. Um, okay, um, so we have. Um, Okay, so so as the textbook talks about the uh, the, the some states are what are called um, uh, franchise registration st states. They treat franchises as a security and require that it be registered before it can be sold in its state. Uh, Texas does not require that, so we don't have the registration that we might have in other states. But it does have a statute that does put some responsibilities upon the franchise or in the name of that statute is called the business opportunity exemption or excuse me the business opportunity act and then the document that franchisors need to file is called the business opportunity exemption notice and this is not an onerous requirement in the state of texas because all that the franchisor has to do is um, reveal and file the information that is already provided to the FTC under these circumstances. So there is some obligation in Texas, but it's a, a relatively minor one. It's it's something that is already being produced. You just have to, the franchisor has to just remember to file it with um, the um, state agency in addition to the FTC. Okay, so franchise agreement, we've already kind of talked about this a little bit, but obviously it's a contract. It's between the franchisor, again, the, the business that um, is trying to sell its model to somebody else. So that would be like McDonald's or Hilton. And then the franchisee, that would be the person buying the Hilton name to open up his own Hilton hotel. If his name is Bob Smith, it's not going to be called Bob Smith's Hotel. It's going to be called the Hilton Hotel. Or if uh, Larry Green is buying uh, McDonald's, it's not going to be called Larry's or Green's. It's going to be called, you know, McDonald's. That's the, the point of it. So that's the franchisor is the recognized name. The franchisee is the, the smaller entity that is buying that, that name, that goodwill, that business model. Um, so uh, this is the hospitality agreement that details the responsibilities of both parties, the franchise or what is McDonald's agreeing to do for the franchisee and what is the franchisee agreeing to do for McDonald's in this case. Um, <clears throat> So typically what's going to happen is the franchisor is going to give the business model to the franchisee. It's going to give access to, you know, again, all of the uh, secret ingredients and secret recipes if it's a restaurant. Um, it's going to give access to the name and to all the advertising that that particular entity does. And um, it's supply chain, giving access to the supply chain so it may be possible to buy things in bulk at lower prices. Of course, all of this is being provided because the franchisee is paying the franchisor for these these benefits so it's not uh, done out of the goodness of the heart the franchisee typically pays an upfront amount to get access to this and then the franchisee will pay a royalty typically on a monthly basis reflecting the sales that the franchisee has had it's not on based upon profits but based upon sales so you could have a franchisee that's losing money but still having some sales and that franchisee under those situations would still need to pay some royalties Sometimes these agreements are difficult to get out of. Um, the franchisee may at some point say, wait a second, um, I now know how to run a McDonald's, so I want to open up my own McDonald's-esque restaurant. And you can see how McDonald's wouldn't want um, 
uh, Larry Green to do that because um, uh, that would take away from from its market share. So it wants to restrict the ability of the franchisee to leave the franchise and yet continue operating in that industry as a potential competitor. So you'd have to look to those aspects of the contract to see exactly what needs to happen if the franchisee chooses to lose. I'm assuming you leave that that franchise. Sometimes the franchisee wants to sell the franchise. And so, again, that t topic is also covered in franchise agreements. Uh, sometimes the franchisor has a right, and I think I have a slide on this one, has a right of first refusal. So the franchisor, the McDonald's, the Hilton, uh, whatever, the, uh, the Applebee's, whatever the entity is, um, can come in and say, um, well, you want to sell your restaurant. Well, we have the right to first buy it from you as opposed to having a stranger buy it. Obviously, um, the price would need to be negotiated, all those things. Um, if the franchisee says, nope, I'm not interested in uh, the price that you're willing to offer, I'm going to sell it to somebody else. Well, that new purchaser um, kind of has a choice. He can choose to uh, continue to participate in the franchise so he's going to have to pay in that initial amount of money and he's going to have to commit to those royalties. If that happens um, it's going to be probably a pretty seamless transfer to the new owner of the business. But let's say that new owner says I, I don't really want to run a McDonald's or I don't want to run an Applebee's or I don't want to run a Hilton. I want my own thing. In those situations it's pretty common for the franchisee to uh, take the money that he g gets from the person purchasing his business and then take that and then uh, take a portion of that money to pay the franchise or a termination fee of the franchise. And you can see this termination fee, especially if it's fairly large and it oftentimes is, might make that first officer office, that, uh, excuse me, offer <laughs> that the uh, a franchisor made, even if it was relatively low, it might make that seem more appealing because, yeah, you might get more money from a disinterested uh, person not already involved in the transaction, but you, if you're going to have to pay a termination fee, um, that's obviously going to reduce the amount of profit that you make on the sale of the business. So that's our discussion about franchise agreements. Um, it's a, I'm going to give you a little bit of my two cents about this area, just from a practical standpoint. If you're ever in a position that you're considering um, buying a franchise, it's wonderful to look at the documents, the franchise rule disclosures, but also you'll be given a list of businesses that are operating under the franchise. Um, it's a best practice for sure to call several of those businesses and to talk to people who actually run the business. Um, obviously, those people don't have to agree to talk to you, and sometimes they'll be too busy or not interested in talking to you, but you can get a lot of good information about really how things work in the business and whether this is a franchise that you'll want to participate in. When you're calling them, probably a good idea is to, to pick the same market generally where you're planning on buying your franchise, but not in the absolute immediate area. If you call the franchise owner that's three miles away, he or she may not want you to start a franchise where you're planning on having it because he or she may see your franchise's competition, so he might tend to say, oh no, this is a bad business model, don't do this. On the other hand, if you uh, talk to franchisees in different states or in distant places, uh, there may be different market uh, effects going on that, that might cause either uh, the business model in a different jurisdiction to be more successful or less successful. So ideally, you want to pick a business that's far enough away that you're not going to be in competition with it, but close enough that whatever the local economy issues are, the name recognitions are, uh, all those issues um, will give you a feeling about the, the, the playing ground. Also, you can get good guidance from those individuals. They may be able to tell you things like, you know, buy a, a rent from a cheap location. Uh, you don't need to have a, a great a location, save some money on your rent that way. Or they may be saying it's really, really important that you have primo real estate. And the kind of real estate you want for this is located in this type of facility and this type of lo location and thinking through those issues. Obviously, the world of franchise agreements, we're thinking about it from the hospitality perspective, but you can have franchises in the, really any industry. You could have a, a plumbing franchise like uh, Ben Franklin Plumbing, 
or you could have a an auto repair business like Christian Brothers or something along those lines. So there's lots of different uh, non hospitality related franchise opportunities. Uh, the franchise process works the same whether it's hospitality related or not. Um, as we've already said, many many hospitality businesses are going to be franchise oriented. Um, it's just a much cheaper way for that franchisor to scale up his business um, without nearly without not without having nearly as much of investment in each particular location. Okay, so we're done with the franchise discussion. Let's flip on over to management contracts. And again, this is when we have some separation between the owner and the manager of a business. This is quite common, and uh, we'll talk about how that plays out. So, of course, the, the fundamental document with respect to this relationship when there's a separation between ownership and management is going to be the management agreement. And this is going to define what the business owner has to do and also what the management company, which isn't the owner, has to do, um, what the responsibilities are, what that arrangement is going to be. Um, each one of these businesses can be, you know, its own structure. For example, the business owner might be a corporation. It might be an LLC. It might be a partnership. Um, it could be any of those things. And the management company that is the one that's going to manage it but not own the particular hospitality uh, business can be, again, any of those things, a corporation, an LLC, a partnership, any of those things. Um, So um, let's just think for a couple of minutes about what the potential problems that can arise. So if you're the business owner, probably what you're most interested in is maximizing profits, right? You want to um, earn as much money as you can. Um, of course, you also are concerned about probably the long term. So you don't want to earn a lot of profits, but uh, do that at the expense of uh, your, your capital investments. For example, you want to make sure that you're maintaining your property. Um, so you're going to be spending money to make sure that the business is, is in good shape, that the, the physical facility is maintained appropriately so that you'll be able to maintain this income stream for lots and lots of years. And perhaps in the future, maybe you want to sell it and you want to be able to get a good uh, return on your capital investment. Um, if you're the management company, your motivation is really going to be dictated by the terms of this agreement um, because you're going to be compensated based upon some kind of equation that's in that agreement. So if the equation is, you know, management company gets 10% of all sales, what does the management company care about? getting the maximum sales. So under that situation, the management company isn't so concerned about maintaining the facility. I mean, obviously, if you don't maintain it to some degree, you're not gonna get sales, so you have to have some level of maintenance, but that's not your, your foremost concern. You're also, if you have that your contract, you're not concerned about the expenses. So in that situation, the management company might spend a lot of money uh, more money than is appropriate running the facility to maximize the sales. The idea is, well, if we give people a lot of free stuff, more people are going to stay in the hotel, and that would increase sales. But you might find that that really cuts into the profitability of the organization. So you can see if the management agreement isn't, it isn't aligning the interest of the management company with the interest of the business owner, there's going to be a disconnect. The a management company is going to focus on the wrong parts of the, the equation. So you have to think carefully about what is the business owner's objectives and how what are the uh, compensation strategies for the management company that are going to align it most closely with the owner. And again, the, the, the concern is that there's going to be conflicts. The owners are saying the, the managers aren't running things well. The managers are going to say that the owners aren't providing enough money, perhaps, for the running of the, of the enterprise. And so um, by having a tight contract that specifies exactly what every person is supposed to do, what every entity is supposed to do, and how that compensation is going to be, all of those pieces of the puzzle, the, the clearer they are, the tighter they are, the more the interests are aligned, it reduces the chances of conflicts. I mean, are there still going to be conflicts? Of course there are. But you, uh, but by thinking very carefully about the terms of the contract, you can reduce those possibilities. Now let's talk about the topic of kickbacks and other types of, of misconduct. First of all, this type of thing is very likely a crime, certainly a very serious act of misconduct. Um, imagine that um, 
you are an employee of the management company and um, you your brother-in-law has a lawn care business and um, so it's your job to get bids from all of the local lawn care businesses uh, who might be maintaining the lawns at this hotel um, uh, the, the first bid comes in at $200 a week. The next bid comes in at $300. The next bid comes in at $250. And then your brother-in-law's bid comes in at $500. They're all basically agreeing to perform the same services. You choose your brother-in-law's company because, you know what, he's your brother-in-law. And he may well be giving you some kind of kickback. Maybe he's charging $500 so that he can give you 100 of the $500. He keeps 400 you keep 100 And obviously, that's a pretty sweet deal for you, pretty sweet deal, deal for him. Um, obviously, you're not going to say that to the world. Oh, yeah, I gave this deal. Uh, to this company because he's my brother-in-law you're going to say something like well you know they perform the best uh, they're the most careful with with the lawns their lawns are going to look best yes it's more expensive but they provide a better service um, but still at the end of the day that's not really what's going on you're getting a kickback well um, if you were an employee of the owner the owner could be in a position of saying well, I'm just going to fire you because you're, you're self-dealing in this situation. But you don't actually work directly for the owner of the business. You work for the management company. And so the owner has to be able to figure out what's going on. And since he's somewhat or she's somewhat hands-off, he or she doesn't necessarily know you or know your your day-to-day -day dealings with, with these, these various entities. And so he or she is not in the best position to know if there's some self-dealing going on. Uh, hopefully the management company is is uh, watching this but maybe they aren't either and so you can see if if this happens the management company is probably going to be reluctant to tell the owner uh, because that doesn't make them look very good and so you can see how these can kind of spin out of control to some extent okay so that's our discussion about management contracts let's go forward and talk about conference service contracts and this really covers two different categories of agreements let's first of all see the definition an agreement that details the space products and services to be provided to a group before during and after its meeting okay so um, and obviously when we're saying groups we're, 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 these are really talking about probably in a hotel a full service hotel situation so the groups can be you know really anything it could be a conference or a convention of some type it could be a wedding it could be a family reunion it could be a sporting team all of those things any time where you need a significant number of people in one location um, that isn't their homes then they're going to be a group and they're going to need some type of, of, of contract to keep them all together and, and as one unit and there are two primary aspects to this one is going to be um, the meeting space contract which has to do and this is again it's a full service hotel you'd have this issue the other could be group lodging uh, so let's imagine that you are a large downtown hotel and you are the site for a conference that is coming into town and so you are reserving meeting rooms for the attendees so that they can meet about the various items on their agenda and you may also reserve dining rooms for um, uh, events uh, related to this conference so that's one part that's the meeting space part of the contract but also these these uh, conference attenders are going to need a place to sleep at night they're going to need hotel rooms and so that's likely to be part of that equation um, so you're using both parts or you know both categories of space in your hotel to meet the needs of this population for the most part the meeting space part and um, that, that you're providing um, is going to be a, an inducement to encourage those attendees to rent the hotel rooms uh, it's motivation so that's why that's why conference attenders don't uh, stay at the Drury Inn because the Drury Inn isn't going to have large conference areas. They don't stay at the Hampton Inn because they're not going to have large conference areas. They stay at the large full service hotels that will be able to provide not only rooms but also uh, conference space. 
Now the meeting space aspect is the inducement to rent the room, so it's an important part of a full service hotel, uh, but it's also a scarce resource. I mean, there, there aren't, isn't an infinite number of, of conference rooms or ballrooms or, or that type of space, and so the uh, hospitality manager has to think carefully how he or she can best position that scarce resource, get as much value for his employer or her employer as is possible. And so you have to be strategic about that. And this is going to be a moving target. I mean, there'll be times of the year in which a particular uh, conference area might be in high demand, other times of the year where things are slow. And so you have to constantly be readjusting your prices, readjusting the perks that you offer to motivate individuals to use your services. Let me go back. Here, we've already talked about this one. Okay, so let's talk about the master bill. Okay, let's look at the definition from the textbook. The master bill is a single folio established for a group that includes specifically agreed upon group charges. And they can be called the master folio, the group folio, or the group bill. So when we see the term folio, think bill. This is a master bill for all of the, the larger groups. So for example, let's say um, this you are uh, hosting, your hotel is hosting the Travel Agents of America Society. I'm making this name up, but let's imagine there's such a group and obviously, maybe each travel agent is renting his or her own room from the group of rooms that were reserved. Well, that's probably not going to go on the master bill because each travel agent perhaps will be paying for that bill separately. But the conference space, the um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the big ballroom where they're having the presentations, um, that will need to be paid by the larger group that is uh, sponsoring the conventionary. And so that would fall under the master bill category. Um, the establishment of what goes on the master bill, what doesn't, how those amounts are calculated are obviously a subject of great discussion and negotiation between the meeting planners and the hotel um, uh, staff and the the uh, hospitality managers um, so you have to be very careful to make sure um, you're positioning yourself well with respect to the master bill so that you're making the profit that you want but you're also um, being sufficiently attractive to uh, the various groups that might be using your facility and finally, we have a cutoff date. What is the cutoff date? Again, we're still talking about the group lodging circumstance, so we're not, we're, 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 we're in this, either, it could be that, that we're having just a group lodging contract without having any meeting space contract. So you can have both, or you could have just this, and I suppose in theory you could have just this, but that would probably be not that common. But when we're talking about the group lodging contracts, whether it's part of a larger contract or just a standalone contract, we're going to be interested, or especially you're going to be interested as a hospitality manager in establishing a cutoff date, ideally sooner rather than later for your business goals. And what is the cutoff date? Well, it's exactly what it sounds. It's the date on which any rooms contracted for um, but that have not yet been reserved by the group are returned to the inventory of the hotel. So let's say that the Travel Agents of America group have reserved 200 hotel rooms in your hotel. Um, when I say reserved, what I mean is they've wanted those to be segregated and kept out of the general inventory of the hotel and made available to its members. And so its members call up and say, yes, I'm with the Travel Agents of America group. My name is Teresa um, Smith and I would like to um, rent a room and so then that room is taken so now there were 200 rooms now there's 199 anyway more and more the rooms are are snatched up and now we're down to only having we'll say uh, 54 rooms left so 100 and um, 46 rooms have been uh, reserved and usually guaranteed with some kind of payment um, associated with them. But we have these 54 rooms that have not been reserved yet. And if the cutoff date comes and there's still those 54 rooms available, then those 54 rooms will be released back into the general inventory for the hotel. And that means people who have no connection with the uh, Travel Agents of America group can go ahead and rent those rooms.
Now you can see if you're the hotel, you want those rooms to be released as soon as possible uh, because that gives you more of a chance to rent those rooms to somebody else. I mean, if they don't get released until the night before the event, what are the odds that you're suddenly going to have people calling up that that day or the, or the day of, of the, the, the day that they want the hotel and say, hey, we need a room. I mean, it could happen, but is it going to happen 54 times? Probably not. So you'll want the cutoff date early enough that you have a good chance at being able to uh, rent those rooms once they are released back into the general inventory. Of course, if you are the meeting planner who's, ass who's assigned by the Travel Agents of America group, um, you want to have a later cutoff date because you want to convenience your members as much as possible so they have the most flexibility about scheduling the time. And usually, um, they're going to uh, the, the the contract will provide that the um, uh, attendees are going to get a, a a very good lodging rate. And so, obviously, if the cutoff rate has cutoff day has passed and those rooms are returned to general inventory, probably that deal isn't going to be in effect any longer. So you can see this would be a a topic of negotiation of give and take between the two sides. So this concludes our lecture. We've talked about franchise agreements today. We've talked about management agreements. And then we've talked about um, conference service contracts. Um, if you have any questions about any of the topics we covered in Chapter 5, or really any other topics uh, we covered in any of the chapters, please feel free to email me with your questions or stop by my office hours, and I'll be glad to talk about these in more detail. I thank you for your attention. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.